Atheism is a belief that an explosion took place in a printing press and it caused a book to appear. That's in a simple terms. Explosion billion, billion, billion years ago, there was this big explosion that happened. Out of this explosion, we got creative, intelligent life, laws of universe, all of that came out of chaos. Imagine if I would come to you and I say, this is how this book was written. There was an explosion that happened in Seattle. Because of that, all the colors magically appeared. The words, the, the thoughts, the periods, the, uh, the numbers. The, it's not white, it's a little bit yellow. The appendix, all of that stuff just appeared because there was an explosion that happened in a printing press in Seattle. Would you believe? And of course, the reason why you don't believe it is because you're not educated. But even an uneducated person will know that it's not possible for creation, order, beauty come from chaos. And if you don't believe that, have your kids make a mess. It's a mess. Not beauty. Not creation. Not order. Because chaos doesn't bring order. Mess doesn't bring intelligence. It doesn't bring beauty. There had to be a being who is bigger than what he created. There had to be an author for the book to be created. There had to be a printing press. There had to be something that was creating that a machinery. So what happened is that in the time of the age of enlightenment, which was a few hundred years ago, especially in Europe, when the universities started to appear, a break away from the organized religion of Catholicism that started to appear mainly in the Europe. People started to elevate reason above the revelation of God's Word. Science became as important, actually more important, as the Scripture. And if it doesn't line up with your reason, and if it doesn't fit into the science, we reject it. It can't be real. Anything supernatural, anything that is not, doesn't make sense, you reject it. A new religion that appeared, that didn't reject the Creator God, but rejected Bible, Jesus, salvation. It's called deism. The third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, was also a big proponent of that. And Thomas Jefferson was a brilliant, great guy who had a very flawed theology. Deism pretty much says that God is like a watchmaker. You know when the watchmaker makes a watch, he puts all the, all the mechanisms inside. The watch runs on its own. The watchmaker doesn't keep the watch churning all the time. He just walks away from the watch and the people who wear it, he doesn't care what you do with it. The watch runs on its own. So deism is a belief that there is a creator. Because you can't explain away the beauty, the order, the natural laws, the universe. There has to be someone who created this complex mechanism. There has to be a divine being. And the devil brought another idea in the age of enlightenment that this created being is a watchman. He made the world. He created the laws, but he is distant from it. Therefore, Jesus is not God. Therefore, Bible stories of God's intervention are a bunch of fables by people who are stupid, who don't have education. They're in third world countries. That's just crazy stuff. They're not intelligent enough. Deism is a heresy. It's not biblical because God does speak. God does communicate through our conscience. God speaks through other people. God speaks through dreams and visions. People encounter angels. We see that God came in, the G in Jesus. Jesus claimed that He was God and He died on the cross for us. And God till this day intervenes in human affairs. We hear miracles and yes, some of us can discredit and say, Oh yeah, this is just a, you know, people came into an environment. Their back was, pain was gone in their back and other things. But you know, that's not a real miracle. But there are miracles that are documented by the doctors where the doctors themselves say this. This is a miracle. It can't be explained by science. Microscopes, we, we, we reached our limit. We cannot explain that. There was a guy during the age of reason, the enlightenment. He was a Scottish philosopher. His name was David Hume. And why is David Hume important? Because Greg Keener, who is a New Testament leading scholar, said this. Those today who claim that science and 
historiography denies the possibility of miracles are repeating not scientific observations but philosophical premises stemming from Hume. Now what this means is anyone who today says I reject miracles, that's not possibility. They're not coming from scientific observations. They're coming from philosophical idea mainly propagated by David Hume. David Hume believed in four, and I'm going to simplify this in a very simple terms, believed in four of these ideas. One, no miracles have been proven by smart people. Not true. People are often like to believe in spectacular things. Miracle stories come from less informed and less developed places. Meaning places where it's not third world country, people are intelligent, miracles don't come from those places. All religions say miracles happen, so it's hard to say which one is more true. David Hume said, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. And as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws. The proof against a miracle from very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. For those of you who lost me on the third word, what this means is this. Miracles violate laws of nature. Laws of nature cannot be violated. Therefore, miracles cannot happen. Now, it makes sense in your head, but it's just not true. Laws of nature, for example, the law of gravity works like this. If I throw something, something falls to the ground. I didn't violate the law of gravity. It didn't stop working when I interfered, when I intervened. And I want you to hear what um, Keener, he wrote a book on miracles. For those of you who are scholarly and everything has to go through your mind, I would encourage you to buy his two books on miracles. And he says this, science as science involves repeatable events so it normally cannot, as science, pronounce judgment on specific unique events in history, such as many define miracles to be. Meaning, science studies things through repetition and observation. Science cannot pronounce judgment on events that get involved or happen in the history. That's where history has to come in, not science. Oxford philosopher said the following, if there is no God, then the laws of nature are the ultimate determinants of what happens. But if there is a God, then whenever and for how long and under what circumstances laws of nature operate depend on God. Any evidence there is a God, and in particular evidence that there is a God of a kind who might be expected to intervene occasionally in the natural order, will be evidenced supporting historical evidence that he has done so. In other words, miracles are outside of scientific investigation. They are not outside of historic research. How did you know that Alexander the Great lived? Not because science told you that. History did. You don't go to science when you go to history. And history works. You interview people who experienced that. You verify that. And by that you know if that would be true or not. When 500 people claim to see Jesus depart into heaven, all 500 people were not stupid, illogical or hallucinating. One person can hallucinate. Three people maybe. 500 at the same time cannot happen. And the scripture has a lot of verification of witnesses who have experienced the things we place our trust in. That's why when people even testify of supernatural intervention, cancer that was progressing and is supposed to kill a person and cancer stops in its tracks, disappears without any trace and the doctor cannot explain it, give person a clean bill of health. Now science cannot do anything there. History can. You can investigate. You can ask a person and based on that you can come to the conclusion there is a God who intervenes. Amen. Miracles are not a violation of the laws of nature. They are an invasion of the kingdom of God. Four cases, four reasons for miracles. And the reason why I am speaking about today is because the church you came into believes in miracles. We expect them. We celebrate them. And I'm going to give you today a view about supernatural miracles that some of you will find 
extremely interesting and others of you will find it motivating. My desire today is to encourage every student here to anticipate God, heal people when you pray for them. My desire is for every parent today not only to go to the doctors and have a good medical insurance and dental insurance, take care of your health, but also when all of our care fails that we always quick to believe in intervention of God in our affairs. Amen. Four reasons why we believe in healing and the miraculous. Number one is God's name. The Bible says His name is Jehovah Rapha, God who heals. His name is Jehovah our banner, the God who fights for us. He's Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He is our shepherd. Everything about God's name reveals to us that His capabilities. Now we know He's all-powerful, but in dealing with humans who have fallen into sin, God reveals different attributes also of His character in His name. When you say, for example, when I come up and say, I am a YouTuber, you will know a few things. I probably know one or two things about YouTube. If you come to me and you say, you're an electrician, but you don't know what to do with electric wires, then you're lying. When you say you're a mechanic, that means you know how to work the stuff in the car. When God comes and says, I'm a healer, means healing is not something He does on the weekends. It's who He is. Therefore, you can expect God to do it. The second reason for miracles is God's nature. He actually wants to do it. God, the Bible says, Jesus was moved with compassion. There are people who believe this. The only reason why Jesus healed people is to prove that He was God. It's kind of like to say that Joseph plays piano to prove to everyone he has fingers. No, Joseph plays piano because he likes to make music. But it does prove he has fingers when he plays piano. When Jesus heals somebody, it's not to prove he is son of God. Now, it does prove that. It's a witness to his divinity. But the reason why Jesus healed, the Bible gives us the motive. He loved people. Our God is not this cold God who's after running for verification so everybody get verified. He actually loves people. He is good. Amen. He wants to do it. Have you met people who are good at something, have education in it. They just don't like to do it. One of the things we've struggled at Hungry Gen is to have people who are qualified in the area of kids, working with kids, to actually serve in kids ministry. I remember first time that I met somebody who was a teacher and successful teacher, had a classroom, made good money. And I asked this individual if they could serve in kids ministry. They said, absolutely not. I said, hell will go cold before I serve in kids ministry. And I'm like, I don't get it. You went to school for four years. You're teaching kids. Why don't you help in the area you're actually most gifted in? They're like, man, if I see kids one more time, five days is enough. I don't want to see them on Sunday. God is not like that. God is not somebody who's qualified in the area he doesn't want to be involved in. Today we have a kids director Brittany, who's not only educated, but who loves to serve in that area and who is serving in that area. God is more like that. He's like, hey, I'm good at this and I actually want to do it. I want to do it on Sundays. I want to do it on Saturdays. Jesus says, my father is always working. He loves to heal the sick. He loves to set the captives free. He loves to provide. He loves to hear our prayer. Our petitions is not annoyance to God. It's not like God's like, oh, okay, finally, driving me crazy. He's not this unjust judge and we are some kind of an unfortunate widow. We are the bride. He is our bridegroom. We are the children and He is a good Father. The third cause for the miraculous is the cross. Not only it is God's nature, not only it is His desire, his, his, his name, but it's also the cross. What does that mean? When Jesus was healing people in Matthew chapter 8, the Bible says that, it says this, and it was done so that He, that it will be fulfilled what was spoken by Isaiah, that He bore our sicknesses and disease upon Himself. In other words, Jesus is healing people, casting demons out, and Matthew, who mainly wrote to Jewish people, that's why in Matthew you see so much references, it is said, it is said, and the, the, the references to the Old Testament prophecies, and Matthew says, let me give you why this is happening. He says, Jesus did that because He's about to take everyone's sin, sickness and curses on the cross. And now this sickness and this sin is no longer technically illegal in their life. 
see the Jewish people prior to the cross was getting everything, all the benefits. Have you ever been to the store, especially when you were a child and your parents got the ice cream and you opened it before they paid for it? And then they brought the empty uh, paper uh, with, with the barcode. They were scanning the empty one because you already, you had it right there. Like you can't scan this. This is, this is, this is already going through the process. Jewish people pretty much ate the ice cream before the cashier and somebody paid for it already. Everything they had, the forgiveness of their sins, for, uh, healing, was everything because one day Jesus will scan the barcode and pay for everything. Today we are on the other side of the cross. We are out of the store where everything in the cart is already paid for and we can partake of it because healing is the children's bread. Deliverance is the children's bread paid by Jesus on the cross. Do you know why you can contend for your healing? Because that sickness was placed on Jesus. Do you know why you can receive freely forgiveness from sin and never walk in guilt? Is because that sin, God didn't clear the record. He paid it in full. That's why when Jesus was hanging on the cross, He said, it is finished. In the original language, the word it is finished is paid in full, meaning I paid for it. My sins were not got put under the carpet. My sins were paid for. That means I am free from that guilt. That's why I can believe for healing. That's why I believe in, in, in deliverance from demonic oppression and curses and generational curses. Why? Because on the cross, Jesus paid for that. Cursed is anyone who hangs on the tree. He was cursed that I can be blessed. He died so I can live. He was rejected so I can be justified and accepted. He experienced poverty so I can be enriched through His poverty. He experienced that so I can experience this. Somebody give God some praise. Come on. Those of you in the first sanctuary, in the second sanctuary and online, give Jesus Christ a clap offering for what He did on the cross. He is the Jehovah who heals you. He wants to heal you. And sickness is illegal in your body. It's kind of like this. Let's say that you're making car payments and you're making car payments and you're very fortunate. Your grandma decides to pay for your whole car. The whole, what is it, $10,000 left paid off. And the company that you were paying to every single month decides to keep sending you monthly payments. Now you can still pay them. The company will take your money. Or you can say, hey, uh, my grandma paid for it. I, I don't have to pay for it. You can receive healing exactly the same way. This sickness Jesus took on the cross. It belongs on the cross. I can receive healing in Jesus' name. But the fourth cause of the miracles is the kingdom. It's the invasion of God's kingdom in our realm. I want you to see what it says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 28. Matthew 12 verse 28. It was right after the deliverance from demons and Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons with the power of the devil. And Jesus says this to them, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. I want you to notice, Jesus doesn't say, if I cast out demons, it's because, you know, I took the curses on the cross. He doesn't say, well, it's because I took the sicknesses and therefore now I'm just distributing the goodies God paid for through my sacrifice. Jesus gives this insight from heaven's perspective why God is interested in showing miracles in our life. It says, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, he says, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Meaning, you just got invaded. Something just burst from the unseen into the seen. From the eternal into temporal. From the invisible into visible. Let me share with you three main things. Number one, understanding of the kingdom. Jesus' main message was the message of God's kingdom. Word salvation in the gospel is mentioned twice. Word saved is mentioned 10 times. Word kingdom is mentioned 127 times. He did parables about the kingdom. Jesus says the new birth is coming into the kingdom. He says pray for the kingdom to come. He's, he came as a king. Herod was threatened by him as a king. He preached the kingdom. He died as a king. Now for most of us, word king the only thing that rings in our mind is few spoiled kids from UK who belong to that family, a royal family, and complaining, coming to the United States, complaining how hard it is for them to live in the mansion. 
So most of us, when we think of kingdom, we're like, man, that's, that's, that, that's not what kingdom really is about. We live in a democracy. So when we read the Bible, we read the Bible through democracy. Our kings get elected or elections get stolen. Um, our presidents go to jail or some who don't go should go to jail. So our presidents stuff is in our political arena is just crazy. So when we read the Bible, we read through what we see in our political arena. Just in a little nutshell, kingdom operates differently. Kings are never voted in and they're never voted out. They're born kings. Presidents get voted in and they have to say whatever they can say to you so you can vote them and they don't keep their promises a lot of times. Kings don't do it like that. Kings are born into power. King's word doesn't get debated on the night news and jokes are made about it. King's word is authority itself. It's the power itself. Jesus came on this earth and the Herod from the beginning was threatened from the baby because this was a king that was born. Not just the Messiah, not just the Savior or the healer, but the king. Something we miss about. Wise men came to worship the king. Jesus' main message wasn't, hey guys, love each other. Hey guys, just be nice to each other. Hey guys, give a slap. Have your neighbor slap you again here. Hey guys, just be nice. Jesus' message was kingdom. Everything about demonstrating the kingdom. Everything was about showing the character of the kingdom. Everything about the kingdom that is coming and the kingdom kingdom that has come already. Interesting that the Bible tells us that the kingdom, there's a kingdom of God and a kingdom of heaven. There's really no difference between the two. Theologians try to uh, split the hairs, but a lot of times they're used interchangeably. The kingdom of heaven is more like a realm, more like a place where God dwells. The kingdom of God is more like a reign or a person, God himself, Jesus Christ. So when he came, the kingdom came. Jesus tells us to preach the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel is not our message. The gospel is a description of our message. We are not commanded to preach the gospel, but the gospel of the kingdom. Gospel is not good ethics, good religion, good morality, good views, good opinion, good advice. It's a good news. In the first century, the word gospel and evangelize were not religious words like they are today. When I say, let's go evangelize, you know what that means. Let's go convert some people in the park and tell them about Jesus, hand them a hungry gen card and hopefully they can pray a sinner's prayer. And that time the word gospel and evangelize simply meant heralding a good news that a new emperor has been installed in the Roman Empire. Heralds or evangelizers would proclaim this new good news, telling people that new era of peace, salvation and blessing has come upon them. They exhorted everyone to get on their knees and to welcome their new emperor. So the gospel that disciples, apostles preached was the gospel that Jesus is the new Lord who has ushered a new era of peace, salvation, transforming everything. So go with me to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 7 and verse 8 and Jesus says the following, as you go preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The new Lord is in town. He's approaching. The new emperor, if I can use the Roman terminology, is here. And Jesus says, I want you to right away demonstrate this. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have given, freely you've given. Because see, this kingdom that has come in Jesus, Jesus inaugurated it. This kingdom doesn't have sickness, that's why you heal the sick. It doesn't have demons, that's why you drive out demons. It doesn't have death, that's why you raise the dead. It doesn't have leprosy, that's why you cleanse the lepers. It doesn't have greed, that's why freely you receive, freely you give. It doesn't have poverty, that's why you help the poor. So I want you to give people a foretaste of the kingdom that is not visible because miracles, signs and wonders is an invisible kingdom of God bursting into the visible realm. The kingdom of God is both already and not yet. Now for those of you especially younger in the faith and younger people, I want you to listen with both of your ears and most of your brain. Jesus inaugurated, announced it, that kingdom at his first coming. But it will be consummated at his return. What does that mean? Jeremy, can I borrow you for a second? Quickly. Jeremy right here is engaged. Jeremy, when is your wedding day? Uh, September 23rd. September 23rd. 
Jeremy is gonna get married on September 23rd and Jeremy is engaged. We can give him some appreciation. <laughs> Inaugurated, it's when Jesus announced it. Consummated is when it's gonna be complete. Inaugurated, think of an engagement. Love is expressed, but it's not consummated yet. Meaning both people don't live together. Both people are not yet involved in a very deep, intimate way. From the day of inauguration until the day of consummation, there is this period where every day you're longing for that day, like Jeremy is. Now, Zach is sitting in the back over there. On the same day that Jeremy is getting married, Zach is going to host a youth conference. Can I ask you honestly, Jeremy, and do not lie. Are you thinking about the youth conference? And if you would be, we would have a problem. Why is he not thinking about the youth conference that falls on the same day? Because that's going to be the day where his love is going to be consummated. It's going to come to its perfection. That's his big day. He's looking forward to every single day. But that love that that's going to be consummated on that day is every day being expressed in limited ways. The kingdom of God is going to be consummated on that day when Jesus will come. But Jesus already, if I could use the terminology that's not perfect, proposed, engaged. We expressed our love to Him. He died for us. And to deposit, to make sure that, you know, we don't get scared. Jesus gives the Holy Spirit. He gives the Holy Spirit as a down payment. He says, listen, I got you guys. I'm coming back. The wedding is already scheduled. The Father already has the date. So I want you to look forward to, not the Antichrist, the Beast and the 666, look forward to the wedding day. But Jeremy is. He's looking forward September 23rd. It's not a bad day for him. September 22nd might be. But September 23rd is not a bad day. Yes, September 22nd might be a bad day for the church. The bad boy Antichrist might come, a lot of bad stuff might happen. But the day we're looking forward to is the kingdom of our Jesus Christ being consummated and we being the bride gonna have that wedding with the Lamb, with Jesus the bridegroom. So while other people are going into who is the next Antichrist, when is the 666 and all of that stuff happen, nothing wrong with the prophecies, but we're looking forward to the redemption that draws near. We're looking forward to the wedding day that is already on God's calendar, that Jesus is going to come and consummate that kingdom on this earth. But now, with in love, now with anticipation. We build relationship with the Holy Spirit, with Jesus. And we see this kingdom that's not yet. The wedding is not yet, but love is already here. <laughs> Our connection to Jesus, the manifestation of that kingdom is happening now, here. But one day, it's going to be consummated in that day. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy. Satan was defeated in the ministry of Jesus and then the cross, but his final destruction awaits the end. Complete salvation and full kingdom inheritance await the future. This explains why sometimes you read scriptures and it says this, we are saved. And then it says, we are gonna be saved. You're like, I'm confused. Am I saved? It's kind of like this. You're engaged, just not married yet. We are saved. The penalty of sin is dealt with. The, the, the power of sin is broken, but not yet. The presence of sin is not gone yet. We are delivered, but we're still going to be delivered. We're delivered, broken the power of the enemy. The curses are being broken, but there's going to be still that consummation, that time, that wedding day where Jesus is going to make everything right. Are you with me? The church lives simultaneously in both ages when salvation has been accomplished, but not consummated. The Judaism, Jews always saw the kingdom of God as something that's going to happen at the end. So they were shocked when Jesus came and said, 
the kingdom is here. They're like, but when this king will come, everything is going to be done right. That's kind of like they thought only of the wedding. Jesus brought the engagement. He intervened with his kingdom and says it's happening here right now. Deliverance is happening. That's kingdom breaking through. I'm making this contact. I'm expressing my love. I'm revealing my goodness to my bride. My kingdom is being expressed. Since the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Consummation of the kingdom. And let me just give me just a few more minutes to talk about that day, that wedding day. Because sometimes we we go through different things in life and we forget about where we're going to. A lot of people think that God in the last days will restore Garden Eden. But God is not a God of the past. He's always God of the future. God is not going to restore the garden because in Genesis 1 and 2 there was a garden. In Revelation there was a city. In Genesis people were butt naked. In Revelation, they were clothed with righteousness. In Genesis, we see a man falls in love with the woman. In Revelation, we see Jesus falls in love with the church. In Genesis, we see a man goes to sleep and the rib is removed, made into a woman. But we see in Revelation that the Lamb of God who died for us and the church was born out of His side when the water and the blood was poured out. In Genesis, we see day and night. In Revelation, we see no more night. In Genesis, we see the appearance of a serpent. In Revelation, we see the destruction of a serpent. In Genesis, we see a pain. Your pain will be multiplied, God said. But in Revelation, it says there will be no more pain. In Genesis, we see that there was the introduction of the curse. God brings curse on the land. But in Revelation, it says there shall be no more curse. God is not going back. God is not trying to restore what Adam lost. God is trying to bring even greater redemption redemption to what we lost. God is not just restoring, God is redeeming and making it better than it happened in the garden. And my friend, that is the day we are looking forward to. And yes, it may sound like a fantasy for some of you. That's why Jesus says, it's not just going to be a beautiful wedding, it's going to be also this thing where the kingdom of God appears now. Miracles are God's preview foretaste, third point, in breaking of the kingdom. Miracles are foretaste of the coming restoration of God's creation and redemption. Miracles are sneak peek into what God's kingdom is going to be like. Miracles are the appetizers of what's to come. Put it in a more of a smart way. Miracles are future facts becoming present preview. Have you ever watched a movie, but before you watch the movie, you watch the preview, the trailer? It's like, you saw a Race to Deliver trailer? Of what's going to happen at Race to Deliver? A bunch of screaming and yelling. It's like a capsule form. Three days put into a minute and a half. That's what miracles are. They are the foretaste of what's to come. Why did Jesus calm the storm? Because when God is going to establish His kingdom, He's not just going to give us new bodies. He's going to give us new earth. It's His creation. He will redeem. Creation groans for the redemption. Why did Jesus rose people from the dead? It's because it's a foretaste that one day we will experience. Now when He rose them from the dead, they still died. So that's why it's not the full completed meal because when we will be raised from the dead, our bodies will never die. Why did Jesus heal the sick? Because He was giving us appetizer, a taste, a, a, a Costco version, a sample, a free sample. Can I try this? Can, can, can I try that? Healing is a divine sample into the kingdom that you're going into. That's why when you feel healing, even in the first service, tears will roll down people's eyes and they say, I can't believe. It's not the fact the body is functioning well, but it's the fact that also something just happened to me. Something touched me. When the prayer gets answered, there's such a belly, just overwhelming sense of joy. What, what is that? You know the kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. It's a sample of what's coming as your daily 
24-7 existence. Joy, peace, righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Why does God want to do miracles today? Because God wants everyone to have a sample, a preview, a foretaste of what's to come. That's why when He cast out demons, He says, I cast out demons because the kingdom that kingdom you Jews are expecting one day that's coming, it came already. Everybody is getting a sample. When you're getting miracles and healings and provision and supernatural invasion, it's the invisible bursting on the scene into the visible. It's the eternal that is bursting on the scene into the temporal. God is not discrediting the temporary life. God is not bashing on it. God is not agnostic. Who simply said everything is spiritual, nothing is physical. No, God values this because He created this and He chooses to intervene to give us a foretaste, a preview, a trailer, a little appetizer of what's to come. To, to deny miracles. It's almost like going to the restaurant and say, no, I don't want appetizers. I just want them. I will wait for the full meal. Me? I want them appetizers. Sometimes I like appetizers so much that when they bring the full meal, I say, I ain't got, I ain't got room. Do you have the dessert menu? <sighs> appetizers are God's miracles to whetten your appetite and to prepare you while you are on this journey for what's to come. A beautiful story of this, and I'm going to come to the end, was in John chapter 11 when Mary and Martha lost lost their son, their brother. Lazarus died. They called on Jesus. Jesus didn't answer. Jesus comes back some days later. Lazarus is buried. Verse 32, and then when Mary came to see where Jesus was, she saw him. She fell down at his feet and says, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would have not have died. Verse 33, therefore when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. I love the fact that our God does not have dry eyes. He's connected with us. He loves us. But I also love that he doesn't just sympathize. He conquers. Then Jews said, see how he loved him. And some have said, could have not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Martha begins to tell Jesus that Lazarus will rise from the dead. And Jesus repeats to her and he says, yes, he will rise from the dead. And then Martha has this thing. She says, uh, Jesus, but if you would, verse 21, if you would have been here, my brother would have not have died. And verse 23, he says, your brother will rise again. And Martha goes in. She knows the theology about the wedding, about the consummation of the kingdom. And she says, I know he will rise in the resurrection of the dead. And I love this about Jesus. He says, I am resurrection. Martha is first distracted by her disappointment. Jesus didn't come on time. He didn't answer my prayer. Jesus comes on the scene and Martha says this thing. She says, I know now, Jesus, you didn't come on time, but if you could talk to God, Jesus is like, uh, woman, I am God. What do you want? Yeah, Jesus, I know he will rise one day. Jesus says, yes, he will. One day he will rise from the dead. And then Jesus says this, I am resurrection. Meaning the future wants to burst open into the present. The future resurrection wants to make an appearance in your present reality. Would you let it? It all depends on how you view Jesus. Is Jesus just someone that you're so familiar with and you love him or is he God? Is he the King of Kings? And where is your faith? Is your faith Jesus? I prayed that one time you didn't answer it. Didn't, doesn't mean he didn't hear it. I prayed that one time but nothing happened Jesus. And then most of us go from disappointment to just this stuff where <laughs> I'm not going to trust God anymore. I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to get my hopes up. So now I'm going to put all of my hope in something that's going to happen long, 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 long from now. When the sweet by and by, one day over there, yeah, I believe one day he will rise from the dead. But now in here, I just want to protect my heart from getting hurt again. So I won't believe in anything. I'll just hope in for the future because I have so much disappointment with my past. 
What I'm going to ask you today, don't allow your faith to be crucified between the disappointment of the past and a future that you don't have control over. Have faith for today because this Jesus who will rise people from the dead when His kingdom comes is standing right in front of you and says, I am resurrection. I am your healer. I am your deliverer. Could you trust in me? Hope looks to the promise. Faith looks to the one that's promised. Hope says tomorrow. Faith says now. Faith says like the woman with an issue of blood. She didn't say, oh, if only I would have not been. If only, if only I would have been there when Jesus was there. She says, if only I touch him, I will be made whole. That's faith. Disappointment says, if you only would have prevented that accident, that, that divorce, that problem, that sickness. If only I, Jesus, if you would have only been there. Jesus says, I am resurrection and life. You can place almost like a trust in Him right now that He can move in your situation. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Jesus Christ is not just a good moral teacher. He is the King of the universe. He carries an embodiment of kingdom with Him. His kingdom, it's not hard for Jesus to heal. In fact, He looked at that Lazarus and said, Lazarus is sleeping. What you call death, Jesus calls a nap. Because that's His kingdom. His kingdom is superior. His kingdom is mightier. His kingdom is invisible. His kingdom created the world you live in today. Jesus is standing with you today through the power of the Holy Spirit. And He says, I want you to believe for the impossible. Believe for the impossible. Faith takes God without any ifs, D.L. Moody said. Corey ten Boom said, faith sees the impossible, believes the unbelievable and receives the impossible. Faith sees the invisible, believes the unbelievable and receives the impossible. And I love how Martha answers Jesus. After Jesus says, I am. See, for us, I am doesn't mean a lot. For Jewish people, that's the way God introduced himself to Moses. When he said, Moses said, God, what is your name? And God said, I am. So they all knew that's a special name to their God. And Jesus says, Martha, you just asked me to call God and ask him. And Jesus said, I am. And Martha changes everything. And she says, I know you are the Christ, the Son of God. You're here. And then she says this, who is to come. The future just arrived in the present. What is faith? It's allowing what's to come to arrive now. Now will this mean that if you experience healing you'll never die? Jesus never said that because Lazarus still died. Lazarus never experienced that resurrection. He just experienced a sample, a preview, a trailer, an appetizer, a foretaste. Jesus is interested in healing you because it's His nature. It's His heart because He loves you. He took your sickness upon Himself. And Jesus has a kingdom that you and I are invited into. And He wants that kingdom to burst open. This kingdom will make everything perfect. But now, it's arriving now in our world and begins to influence there and there and there through healings, through deliverance, through forgiveness of sins, answers of prayers. It's bursting on the scene. That's why we are a triumphant church. We have a future. We have hope. We're not Debbie the Downer. We're not looking forward to the future and everything's just going to be worse and bad. For the devil, yes, but we are a triumphant church. We will see the glory of Jesus. We will see the kingdom bursting open. And there is nothing the devil can do to stop it. There is nothing hell can do to stop it. Gates of hell will not prevail against us. We will see the Lord heal people. We will see the Lord deliver people. We will see the Lord change people. That's why when you go into your workplace, when you go into school, and when it comes to praying for other people, like, man, but what if God doesn't heal them? Let God worry about that. The kingdom will manifest. The King will show His power. The Spirit of God will flow. All you got to do is reach out by faith. Oh, but I don't want to get my hopes up. And then, listen my friend, you don't put your hope in your healing. You put your hope in the healer. 
oh but I prayed so many times but you know I was so close to God and God didn't answer my prayer that was Martha and Mary's problem see Jesus's love is not found that he always answers when you pray Jesus's love is found that he died for you and he hears your prayer and he desires to answer he loves you he's a good God and yes there are things that happen sometimes we can't explain but let's begin to focus on things that Jesus has explained he is the king and he brought us the kingdom and this kingdom wants to manifest today in your life Thanks for watching this sermon if this was a blessing to you would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message what are you taking home with you from this message also if you enjoyed these messages would you help us and hit thumbs up to this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes, and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.